I like them to leave the lights on with the where the audience is, so I can see if there are any troublemakers back there. <laughs> Right. <laughs> I think you're all veterans of already one or more of our talks, uh, so I, I won't hopefully need to introduce myself again. Uh, there was something that uh, at the close of the last uh, talk that I wanted to mention uh, just because it's it's kind of an obvious thing and <laughs> I get so involved in talking about what happened and how it happened and so on that kind of the bigger picture sometimes gets uh, lost. Who was responsible for the war between the United States and Mexico? Well, I don't think there's any question but that the war would not have occurred had President Polk not wanted to do it, you know, not wanted to go ahead. Uh, I think I did indicate at some point that uh, even Mexican scholars think the Mexicans blundered, the Mexican government blundered in not taking, uh, seizing opportunities to try to avoid this. But the reason that they didn't is because they thought they were going to win it. There was a plan where the Mexicans were going to come up and seize New Orleans and then move up along the coast and capture Washington, D.C. And, uh, and win the war. So it, both sides had inflated ideas of what they could accomplish. The Americans with this tiny little army you know, and, and thinking, oh, well, somehow we're going to win it. Well, eventually they got enough volunteers and so on. Uh, the Mexicans um, had the larger army, and the Europeans, as a matter of fact, thought that the Mexicans were going to win. So sometimes there's this perception that here was a big, powerful United States going to overwhelm Mexico and how unfair that was. Well, that's kind of the way it turned out, but that wasn't the way people perceived it back at that time. I can assure you of that. Uh, though the, the Mexican War was an, an unfortunate uh, development between neighbors. It certainly gave the United States a big advantage in terms of pr territory added to the United States uh, and enabled the United States to um, move ahead and develop transcontinental all the way across the continent. Uh, the Mexicans uh, certainly were in a in, in somewhat inhibited situation. I think after the war, there had been some destruction. Uh, leadership had evaporated. Uh, Santa Ana uh, disappeared, went into exile. Uh, so we're facing a period, or the Mexicans were facing a period, not very positive signs. Uh, well, the war was over in 1848. Mexico stumbled along for a few years. Uh, even bringing the Mexican commander, I mentioned last time, who lost the battles up here at Palo Alto and Resaca de la Palma, brought him in as president in Mexico for a couple of years. Uh, but eventually, the Mexicans turned to Santa Ana again. Santa Ana regained power in Mexico. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of hard to believe at times. And he titled himself, if I'm recalling correctly, his Serene Highness. In other words, he practically was making himself a king towards the end. And finally, he was ousted, uh, forced to flee, and one man came in as president for a month. There were four presidents, if I'm recalling correctly, at the Battle of Palo Alto, four presidents. Ulysses S. Grant, Zachary Taylor, 
um, oh, the um, uh, Mexican general in charge there, who I just mentioned, and now I'm forgetting it. And, because I tried to get the other name in there, another general at the battle, Romulo Diaz de la Vega. He, <laughs> he became president for a month. So, kind of, that's, that's about all you can say about him. Uh, anyway, Santana fled, went into exile. He uh, eventually, much later on, is allowed to return to Mexico. Had no money, uh, nearly blind. His wife took care of him and he died in Mexico. But we're not going to hear from him on the political scene any further. Uh, the revolution against Santana was led uh, by Juan Alvarez. Sure. There's Juan Alvarez, uh, an illiterate um, regional, uh, had a little regional army. And they came in, he and his people came in and took over Mexico City. Uh, and brought the liberals into power. This, remember we talked about conservatives and liberals in Mexico, the conservatives favored the church and the military and the liberals wanted reforms. Well, the liberals get into power here. Uh, Juan Alvarez is the one who made it possible, but he really wasn't the political leader at this time. Uh, they, the new liberal leadership, some of whom we'll mention, but probably the most famous is Benito Juarez. Uh, they, let's see if I get a little more here for you. This gives you an idea how the country was divided. Notice that uh, conservative elements usually controlled the area around Mexico City, whereas Veracruz was known as the primary location where the liberals held power. So you can kind of get an idea of it there. I find this uh, little map kind of entertaining. For example, here's Nicaragua. Here's something called the Mos Mosquito Kingdom. These were uh, mosquito Indians <laughs> under the control of the British. Uh, here's Belize and here's a country that they call Maya because frankly the Mexicans didn't exercise control over it at that point. And here's Guatemala and here's who knows. You know, that white area. And then, uh, so there are a lot of areas that were not completely formed yet as you can see from that map. Uh, well, the liberals got into power thanks to Juan Alvarez. And they created a couple of laws, the Ley Juarez and the Ley, uh, uh, why am I slipping this morning, the Ley Lerdo. Uh, the Ley Juarez was obviously named for Benito Juarez, the Ley Lerdo from Lerdo de Tejada. Uh, and these were cabinet level people. Okay, what did the liberals do? Okay, the uh, Ley Juarez uh, took away the fueros the powers. Remember we talked about fueros, special powers that the military and the church had to have anybody accused of crimes tried in church or military courts. That's a good example of fueros. There were others, but I think that's, those were the key ones. So the Le Juarez got rid of the fueros. The uh, Le Lerdo also was forcing the sale of church lands. The church owned half the property in Mexico, maybe more. Why? Because when people died, they leave their property to the church in hopes of going to heaven. <laughs> so gradually that 
property mounted up and the church was a monopolistic uh, controller of the uh, of property. So they're going to be forced to sell off their property uh, and pay a tax on it. In 1857, all of this was brought together in the Constitution of 1857. There had been, you remember, a constitution in 1824 that created a republic. This was the next great development in terms of government, the constitution of 1857. Let me see here. I'll come back to those people. But let me show you Benito Juarez while I'm at it. Constitution, a federal constitution of the uh, United Mexican States. This is the patriotic image, woodcut uh, reproduction, Constitution of 1857, which established the principles of liberalism and was designed to stop dictatorship. But as I mentioned to you before, one of the big problems, uh, they would always write something into the Constitution that in emergency the president can do such and such. Well, of course, then an emergency appears as soon as the president wants to do something. Uh, and and the people who were drawing this up were what we think of as 19th century liberals. These are people who believe in free enterprise, uh, free trade, uh, economic development, uh, the very standard kind of, of liberal perception, somewhat different from what we may have in the current era. But this was the prevailing view, not just in Mexico. I don't want to give you that impression. This liberalism had a great influence in uh, England, in uh, France, in a number of other countries in Europe. So it was not something that had, was homegrown necessarily. Well, the Constitution was rejected by the conservative element backed up by the Pope, Pius IX, Pio Nono, as he was known. Uh, a very conservative Pope, rejected it, said you don't have to obey it. Uh, when I was over in the Vatican uh, just a couple of years ago in St. Peter's, there was some big uh, stuff. I can't remember exactly what it was big uh, statue of Pius IX right there up in near the front. Uh, he was a big hero to the conservative element. Uh, well, this led the rejection of the Constitution, led to a civil war. Civil war that went on for three years in Mexico. Uh, it started when, uh, I'm, I don't think I even want to get into the names of some of these people who were involved. The result was that Juarez, who was acting president, was forced to flee. Went up to Querétaro, which is a city north of Mexico City. Uh, and eventually, he wound up having to go to Veracruz, where he established his government. Remember this, Veracruz, Cruz, that's where the liberals will feel more secure. Mexico City taken over by the conservatives and their leader was Miguel Miramon. Uh, Miramon was a very competent military leader and an honest person. You know, this, he was uh, on the conservative side, but he was not uh, uh, an evil man or anything like that. Not Certainly not a, a Santa Ana type. Uh, let's see. Miramon uh, ultimately becomes uh, president, in, but he's 
running the area around Mexico City. So you have this, Jesus, this is, yeah, I don't know, it's just kind of irritating. Well, this is supposed to be a transmitter that, that will broadcast 300, 300 feet, but I've had trouble with this whenever we do our, yeah. when we do our uh, outside too much, stuff. That, too many noises. Anyway, as I said at the beginning, if you have trouble hearing, come up front. There's still some seats up here. Uh, try to project, but uh, uh, I know uh, since I have my own hearing problems that <laughs> I'm sympathetic to those who share that phenomenon. Uh, anyway, three-year war. Uh, and it got pretty vicious. Uh, uh, for example, the liberals would attack churches and kill priests and destroy altars and that kind of thing. Uh, that's just one example of the kind of thing that went on during this time. Uh, in retaliation, Juarez issued the laws of the reform. The separation of church and state was created at that point by Benito Juarez issuing a proclamation. Of course, he wasn't, didn't have the power to enforce it then because he was in, uh, down in Veracruz. Uh, and Juarez did something for which he is not highly regarded even today by some Mexicans he allowed the McLean-Ocampo Treaty to be created and approved. He, he approved it. Now what's that? Well, this was a deal he made with the United States to allow intervention to protect American interests in Mexico such as a possible train line across the Isthmus of Tehuantepec, which is in southern Mexico, the narrowest part of Mexico. Uh, well, and, and he was getting money for it. The gover his government needed money, and this is one of the ways the, the gringos paid him, uh, paid Mexico this money for this treaty. And it's considered, some people consider that Juarez was selling out his country at that point treaty never went into effect because the American Senate wouldn't approve it. One of the ironies, I guess. So Juarez was saved from that embarrassment, I guess, by the Americans not approving it. Uh, well, ultimately, the liberals triumphed, despite the fact that Miramon uh, was a, a first-rate military strategist. Uh, he finally applied a siege to Veracruz. It didn't work. He had to fall back, and the liberals gained the upper hand. I, I don't, I don't want to dwell on this too much. The point is that Juarez and the liberals won. They took control, uh, and the conservatives, uh, what are they going to do? Well. Uh, opportunity presented itself when Juarez couldn't balance the budget. <laughs> this is one of the constant problems that uh, Mexican governments have because of all the fighting that was going on. The factional fighting is they'd borrow money whoever was in power, borrow money to pay their army, and then when they lost, the next groups would come in and they, somebody would be coming to collect money and, oh, we haven't got any. So then they'd borrow money from somebody else. And so there was a constant debt situation. Well, uh, Juarez faced a huge debt from the uh, Civil War that had just ended. The Europeans, they don't care, well, oh, that was Miramon's uh, loan. No, <laughs> too bad. Uh, he did it in the name of the Mexican government, so you've got to pay up. And what is, uh, it didn't exactly refuse, but he wasn't paying. 
is what it boiled down to. Yeah. And the uh, Europeans decided they were going to come collect. Uh, the tripartite intervention. Three countries, England, France, and Spain, sent over forces to Veracruz to try to force uh, the Mexicans to pay up. And if they wouldn't, I think the idea was, well, guess where customs was collected? At Veracruz. That was the main port of Mexico. I suppose they planned they'd just collect the customs till they got their money. But two of the three countries represented there smelled a rat. And the British and the Spanish pulled out because what they suspected was true. The French had other objectives. The French, under Louis Napoleon, or Napoleon III, as he was known, wanted to restore the French Empire in America. And so they began, they, they said, if you're not paying, we're coming up to do something about it. And here you see the intervention of the French and they began to head up towards Mexico City to collect. And uh, they made it as far as Puebla, where there was an important battle that occurred that we now know today as Cinco de Mayo. So the famous Cinco de Mayo is this battle that occurred at Puebla on the 5th of May. Uh, when I was uh, down in Puebla just a couple of years ago, I've been there a couple times, but just like two years ago, it's amazing. The, the forts that the Mexicans were defending are two little buildings. You know, they're very small. When you think of the attack on the hills and, and the fort and so on, you'd think this massive fort or some. No, definitely not. Uh, the commander of the Mexican forces was General Ignacio Zaragoza, uh, Tejano. As a matter of fact, there's a statue of him in the plaza in uh, Laredo, the main plaza, Ignacio Zaragoza, although he was born at uh, Goliad, where he originated. Uh, and uh, he was the commander. And one of his top lieutenants, a young brigadier, was Porfirio Diaz from Oaxaca. And Diaz led one of the attacks against the French and was very successful. He was a very brave uh, commander. The French were repulsed at Puebla. And this successful battle has become a symbol to Mexicans, I think, of the efforts to repulse foreign intervention. Hence, the celebration of Cinco de Mayo, which now has become the, uh, it's, it's a, uh, what would I call it, a second-rate um, historical item as far as Mexicans are concerned. But Americans, Mexican Americans, have fixed, fixated on it, thanks to the beer commercials. I think was the original, <laughs> original starter of it. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember for years here after the Cinco de Mayo thing began to catch on in the United States, Brownsville wasn't having any part of it. Dizzy Seis was the day that was celebrated here, and is still the day in Mexico that people celebrate. You ask people today, even, I'm afraid, a number of Mexican-Americans, what's Cinco de Mayo? Oh, Mexican independence. No. <laughs> it has nothing to do with that at all. Uh, but that's the struggle in trying to educate about history. Uh, well. Actually, in many places, it's like a festival. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's a kind of thing, yeah. That's what it's become now. Certainly. Antonio does that. Yeah, they've, it, they've turned it into quite a festival. Not and in Mexico. Under, not, uh, in Mexico. not in Mexico. No. no, like I say, it's kind of a second-rate uh, 
uh, episode, although it's acknowledged, it's just not one of the big celebrations. Uh, well, <laughs> it would be nice to say that, well, the French licked their wounds and went home, but they didn't. They retreated to Veracruz, brought more French soldiers over, and marched on Mexico City and captured it. <laughs> so the, the big day is actually a temporary setback for the French in something that they achieved a victory in. They took over not only Mexico City, but they took over Mexico. Yeah. Uh, but it would appear, I guess, too chauvinistic for the French to just rule Mexico directly. So with the support of some conservative elements in Mexico, they decided to bring over a monarch. And that's where Maximilian comes in, Maximilian and Carlota, Carlotta. Uh, Maximilian was the younger brother of the uh, king of uh, Austria. Uh, but he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> when you're the younger brother, he, uh, he played a role in the Navy and uh, he had this beautiful palace, but, uh, you know, didn't have a job. And so he was persuaded by the French and by the Mexican conservatives to come over and become the ruler. I've stressed before that this was not such an unusual or horrific thing back in that era. But I think, well, Maximilian was naive and well-intentioned. He was a liberal in that era. Uh, he came over with Carlota and they arrived in Veracruz. <laughs> Remember, Veracruz is a liberal city. A lot of people shut their doors and windows and would ignored him. And it was not a very good reception, but Finally, he got up to um, the Mexico City and received a big reception there and established his uh, reign as emperor at Chapultepec Castle uh, and proceeded to try to do good from his point of view. He tried to win over Benito Juarez, who of course rejected this. And he tried to do good things in terms of development and uh, helping the Indians, etc. Uh, and he in enforced the reform laws. In other words, even though he was supported by the conservatives, he did things that the liberals approved of, things that the liberals liked. Uh, and, and indeed, the French took over almost all of Mexico. Their little area in the north, up by Paso del Norte, um, Ciudad Juarez today, that's where Benito Juarez put his government. Uh, respected only by the United States. The United States continued to recognize Benito Juarez as the legitimate president of Mexico somewhat like the U.S. recognizes Juan Guaido in Venezuela today as the legitimate president of Venezuela. Uh, the United States couldn't do much about it, however, because what was going on? Civil War. Civil War. The U.S. Civil War was going on. And you had the fighting going on. At one point there were four armies operating here in the Rio Grande Valley. Two on this side, two on the other side, you know, and plus others. So it was a very violent time here in the Rio Grande Valley, I can assure you. Uh, I don't know if I'm losing, getting behind here. There's uh, General Porfirio Diaz at the time of uh, Cinco de Mayo. Here's Napoleon III. And here's uh, the Emperor Maximilian in uh, a portrait. 
and in a photograph, dressed as a Mexican general there. And there is Carlota, his wife, Belgian, if I recall correctly. And <laughs> General Mir Miramon reappears as uh, one of Maximilian's allies. Remember, he had been the conservative leader. Uh, here's a portrait of him. Uh, situation, international political situation began to change. Napoleon found himself uh, facing difficulties in Europe and he began to decide that he wasn't going to be able to recreate the French Empire in America so he decides to pull out. Another reason for that is when the American Civil War came to an end the US government began to put pressure on, uh, on Maximilian and the French. Uh, General Sheridan and 25, at least 25,000 American troops came down here to Brownsville right at the end of the war. As the war ended, here's 25,000 troops. Well, what were they doing here in Brownsville? Well, partly it was to intimidate the, uh, the French and their Mexican allies led by, down here, Oh. General Tomas Mejia, you will see a picture of him up here that's better. This one was taken locally uh, over in Matamoros because that's where he was the commander. Uh, looks Indian, that's because he was. He, he had a strong Indian aspect to him. Uh, remember him. though. Anyway, he had French, Austrian, and Mexican troops here when he was controlling Matamoros. And indeed, he had the Teatro built. The theater over in Matamoros was the Teatro Imperio, or Imperial. Uh, it's now the Teatro Reforma. Uh, let me see if there's something else about that theater. Oh, there's uh, stories that apparently Carlota came up here to Matamoros to inaugurate the theater. Now, that's a little sketchy, but so the story goes. Uh, by the way, uh, when you look at the conservative element, uh, I said that Miramon was basically a good guy. So was this man. Uh, Mejia, M-E-J-I-A, Tomas Mejia. Uh, let's see, pick up my story again. French intervention, Maximilian. Oh, well, the French announced that they were pulling out and they wanted Maximilian to come with him, but persuaded by Miramon and Mejia, who were his loyal supporters, he decided to stay. Carlota left, went over, uh, attempted to persuade the Pope to intervene, went to uh, Napoleon and you know wanted to support more for Maximilian, didn't get it. Apparently she lost her mind at that point. Lived on until 1927, somewhere in Belgium. Castle in Belgium. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Maximilian pulled back for a final defense around the city of Querétaro and uh, he was betrayed and the, the uh, liberal forces, Juarez's forces, captured him and despite protests from all over the world, uh, Juarez determined to execute him as a symbol to others 
you know, that this is wrong, that this kind of intervention is wrong. And so he and Miramon and Mejia, three, were executed at the Hill of the Bells in Querétaro. There's a portrait of Juarez. Uh, this man, I'll mention, because I mention him again briefly, he's the one that represented Juarez in Washington, uh, D.C. during the uh, Civil War, well, during the French intervention, uh, pretty successfully. He wined and dined, little politicos, etc. Uh, so a pretty successful diplomat. Here's Diaz. 1867. Diaz, of course, was uh, supporting uh, uh, Juarez and uh, the, the Mexican elements. He was captured at one point, put in prison, escaped, became a hero for that, and then was involved in several battles against the French. Here's uh, another view of General Mejia. And here's the Hill of the Bells. This is an old photo. You know, they've got much more stuff up there today. But this, notice it looks pretty barren up there. Uh, there's those three monuments are for the three men who were executed at the Hill of the Bells. Uh, with the French gone, Juarez resumes his presidency. And he was indeed was elected president twice more, died in office. Uh, something changed in him. Many people feel that he became a little bit authoritarian. Uh, Mexico kind of stumbled along, however, economically. Difficult time. In his final campaign for president, he was opposed by Porfirio Diaz and uh, Sebastián Lerdo de Tejada. And Juárez died just shortly thereafter. And Lerdo de Tejada was elected. I don't want to get into the details. It's not important. <laughs> the point being, though, that Porfirio Díaz ultimately uh, raised the flag of revolution. Uh, no re-election. As Juarez had got himself reelected several times, two or three times. Anyway, Diaz began his revolution here in Brownsville in Matamoros. As a matter of fact, uh, a house that no longer exists right next to this building, it's where he supposedly spent some time in 1876, although from my reading of it, uh, apparently that place, the roof leaked, so he wound up in what we call the Stillman House, mm -hmm. which was owned by uh, the uh, Trevino family. And uh, Manuel Trevino was, at least under Juarez, he was the Mexican consul here in Brownsville. And now he's supporting uh, Porfirio Diaz. <laughs> uh, Diaz begins his plotting and assembling money, etc. here, and gets support from a number of people. It's believed that Charles Stillman was among those who provided some support to him, or at least the family did. Uh, and he launches his revolution from here, and they take over Matamoros and so on. But when they get down to uh, Monterrey, things don't work out, and uh, Diaz abandons his efforts here and goes back down to his native state of Oaxaca where he revitalizes his revolution under the Plan de Tuxtepec and succeeds. He gains control, takes over in Mexico. 
he won't leave until 1911. He's, uh, but he's elected for a four-year term, and at the end of that four-year term, he steps aside so that his right-hand man, Manuel Gonzalez, the only president we've ever had from Matamoros, Mexico's ever had from Matamoros, becomes president, serves four years. Thus, Diaz had fulfilled his promise not to be re-elected, at least that time. He gets he gets elected back in, and then he never leaves. He's re-elected regularly, rigged elections, of course. But I don't think he really needed them. Diaz was popular, popular figure, and uh, successful in many, many ways. Uh, let me see what I want to add on that. Uh, development, railroads, mining, industry, agriculture, all of these he, he focused on. What he didn't focus on were the needs of the mass of people who lived in poverty, uh, often under the control of the hacendados, the people who owned haciendas, the big estates in Yucatan, uh, a, a good example of uh, what Diaz did that one would certainly disapprove of, the Yaqui Indians lived in northwestern Mexico. Uh, he had them, first of all, he fought some battles with them, and then he rounded them up and sent them to Yucatan to work on the uh, plantations down there. Uh, the Enican or fiber that they make into rope, mm -hmm. twine, uh, and they didn't last long. They died. They were virtual slaves, those Indians that had been sent down there. B. Traven, T-R-A-V-E-N, I think it's E-N, T-R-A-V-E-N. B. Traven is a, a somewhat mysterious figure who wrote a whole bunch of stories about Mexico and the plight of the people. I remember one, reading one of them, the March to the Monterias. The Monterias were the hardwood forests and how they would force these guys to go up there. They'd be employed, yes, technically. Work them hard, pay them off, and then as they began to leave, somehow cheat them out of the money that they had gotten. You know, and then and force them to go back and work again. So very hard times for some people under Diaz for the, a, a well-to-do and even a small growing middle class. Mexico was doing all right. Mexico for the first time became respected among the world of nations, for the first time, really. And tempted as I am to criticize Diaz about it, I must say that I think a lot more people managed to live during his dictatorship than did before. In other words, a lot more people died for a lot of reasons, including civil wars, before Diaz became president. A bunch of people died under Diaz, too. For example, I remember they caught some troublemaker in Veracruz and telegraphed up to Diaz, you know, what should we do with him? Matelos en caliente. Kill him right away. You know, no, don't beat around the bush. Just get it over with. Uh, yeah. So he was a tough guy. He understood how to run things efficiently and effectively. Uh, got along fairly well with the United States. We had some, there were some U.S. issues regarding Indians and borders and so on. I don't need to get into that in this class. Uh, let's see what else I might want to, oh! <laughs> How did, how did Porfirio Diaz manage to run his dictatorship? Well, 
he managed to manipulate the different groups. I don't know if it was instinctive or just that he was very in, so very intelligent, but he was. For example, the military. You don't want to be threatened by some revolution coming out of your own military, do you? Well, the way you solve that is you move the generals around to different armies so that they never get a loyal re relationship to their men. Uh, oh, what about the leaders of the towns and cities in Mexico? Well, you avoid them by creating what were called jefes politicos, political chiefs. There were over 300 of them in Mexico, and those were the ones that you funneled the money through. His loyal jefes politicos, for instance, Matamoros would have had, did have a jefe politico. And everybody knew that as far as the money goes, the federal government money, that's who was in charge. Now the local government, they raised some taxes and so on locally, but they didn't have anywhere near the clout the local officials because of this system of political chiefs. Well, very shrewd in that uh, well, there was something else I had marked down here. Uh, oh, <laughs> the church. Again, very, very shrewd. He didn't change the laws of the reform. The laws against the church were enforced and nominally. <laughs> But, for instance, there were supposed to be no more uh, convents or monasteries. But there were, secretly, mm -hmm. and when he, they would occasionally have a raid against those convents or monasteries, only his wife would go out and uh, warn the people at the convent in advance and they'd all disappear while the raid took place and then they'd all come back. Even before the let up on this pressure on the church, on the clergy, I can remember being in San Miguel de Allende and going to the, the church where they had uh, nuns there in the in the choir, they had a, a altar up front and then over on the side was an area where the nuns, if you looked from the right angle, you could see that they were over there. And uh, so they were still functioning even when that wasn't supposed to be going on. Now it's largely tolerated again. I remember the first time I saw a, a priest out on the streets in a Roman collar. You know, I, I'd been in Mexico for so many years and so much time that I, it, I was kind of stunned to see a priest walking around with a Roman collar on because you weren't supposed to do that. You couldn't wear clerical garb in Mexico. I, uh, I, and I was surprised the first time I went to Mexico and I was in Saltillo, town just south of uh, Monterrey, and I saw the bishop of Saltillo walking from his rectory, I assume, over to the, the cathedral, which was a block away, but he was in full regalia. Well, I, they tolerated that, I guess. Anyway, notice how Diaz bought off or manipulated the institutions that might have posed a threat to him. That's how he stayed in power so long. He did a lot of good for Mexico in terms of development. He was, but it was a dictatorship. It was repressive. There's no question about it. He tolerated no opposition of any significance. Uh, eventually, there will be a revolution. And so I don't forget to bring it up next time when we talk about the revolution. Uh, why did it happen? I think that the regime just got too old. By the end, you look at the picture, a photograph of Porfirio Diaz's cabinet, they're all old men. I don't mean in their 50s or 60s, I mean up 70s and 80s. And he himself was 80 when he left office. Uh, and they, 
it was his regime was no longer dynamic. It was no longer doing the kinds of positive things that enabled him to stay in power so long. It had stagnated. Uh, and so I think that's probably the best explanation for it. Not that the people were oppressed. The people had been oppressed for <laughs> much of his dictatorship <laughs> in many respects. But rather that he was no longer effective in creating the kind of environment that would generate enough support for him to remain in power. And so then the revolution begins. Well, questions? Yes? You know, if you look at Napoleon and Santana and a whole bunch of other leaders, they were exiled. And even Jefferson Davis and Robert Lee came back into society unfettered. Why was that so popular rather than just why was it so popular? Come back to and take over again. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, indeed, for a long time in Latin America, that was a very general thing that if you want overthrew somebody, you didn't kill them, you sent them out, and sometimes they'd be able to come back in. But the idea you didn't want to set a pattern of killing the person you were replacing lest you be replaced and, and the same result happened to you. At least that seems to have been the idea. Yeah, oh, very, very dangerous, yes. How many terms total was he in power? Three or four? Oh no, seven, I think. Seven. He, was, he was president for something like 35 years president of Mexico, although there was that one intervening term when Manuel Gonzalez was uh, president. Uh, yeah, up till 1910, he was re-elected in 1910, and then the revolution started in 1911. 1910, they had a big celebration. It was a hundredth year, hundredth year anniversary of Mexican independence, or at least when they started the war for Mexican independence. And uh, there's a whole bunch of things built in Mexico right during that time, uh, including the Bellas Artes in downtown Mexico City. A very impressive building that you have to kind of walk down to get go up into because it was so heavy that it began to sink into the spongy ground because Mexico City was built on a lake bed, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so a b whole bunch of, oh, the, uh, the post office in Mexico City, magnificent building. If you ever get down there, be sure and see the post office. It's well worth it. But a lot of this was done by Diaz in anticipation of the anniversary. El Angel Monument on Paseo de la Reforma is another 1910 uh, feature. Uh, so <laughs> big celebration and then the collapse, the, uh, the revolution begins. How did the Irishman come into Oh, yeah, you wanted me to talk to you about that a little bit. Uh, Irish were involved in the uh, war between the United States and Mexico. The, uh, now what the hell did they call them? Pardon? Somebody remember that? The, I'm sorry. The San Patricios. The San Patricios. Yeah. The San Patricios. Uh, and they first formed up here because this is where the war began. Mm -hmm. And there were some defectors. Indeed, the one who was kind of the leader of the San Patricios defected here over in Matamoros because the Mexicans were shrewdly playing on the notion that these Irish immigrants who had signed up for the army, U.S. Army, because you'll at least eat regularly, mm -hmm. uh, trying to pray, play upon their being Catholics. And the Mexicans were Catholic, of course, so they say, hey, you know, we're co-religionists, you need to be with us, you should be with us. And there were some deserters who went over and joined with the, and the Mexican side. By the way, the, in the San Patricios, Irish were a minority. There were a lot of Germans in the San Patricios and other people of other 
nationalities. And they fought with the Mexican uh, forces <coughs> all the way down to Mexico City. And ultimately, a number of them were captured at the outskirts of Mexico City. And as the American forces were assaulting Chapultepec Castle, those San Patricios, nooses around their necks, were executed by the U.S. Ironically, the leader of the San Patricios, while he was branded, he was not executed because he had deserted before war had formally been declared. So he was able to, to survive. So that's kind of the story of the yeah, San Patricios. The ones that um, um, deserted were the ones that uh, were killed? Mm -hmm. Only the ones that were uh, that joined any time, those that joined at any time after war was declared, they were they were the executed. By the way, Mexico celebrates with Ireland a San Patricio Day uh, pretty much uh, every year uh, because of the aid that these Irish and others who don't get celebrated uh, gave to the Mexicans. Anything else? Well, I think we've just about run out of time. Uh, next week, the Mexican Revolution. Sure. Um, are there, is there any plan for you to do other presentations like this on, say, the Ohio Company and that era, you know, when the 1780s something, when they started settling Ohio and Indiana and Illinois and Wisconsin, that whole thing? Or we had actually the purchase further on here to the northwest of Arizona, New Mexico. I know what you're talking about. Purchase, all that kind of stuff. American expansion. Exactly. Yeah. yeah uh, we, no plans have been made at this juncture. I submitted, when I started to, to do this, I told um, Tara Putinap that I, I would do this or I could do a six-part series on history of Brownsville. Uh, maybe we'd do something else. We'll see. But that's going to probably, this is probably going to be pretty much it for this, okay. this year. I'm just curious. Oh, yeah. Like, I tried to read the Lewis and Clark Journal's oh, book, and I keep falling asleep, so I gave up on that. There's a book by a fellow by the name of McCullough. Yes, David McCullough. Yeah, exactly, about the expansion with the Ohio Company into the Midwest. He's, I read that whole book. He does very good, I would call, popular. Yeah, yeah, not not a lot of serious details, but very interesting. Yeah, no. The whole story. That's that's why I enjoy reading them. I have something for you to look at. Oh, great! Uh, feel free to. This is just a reader, but it'll give you a variety of things to look at in there. Wow! And. Uh, You'll see in the table of contents that I've oh, marked stuff. I love that. Well, yeah. <laughs> this is stuff that I will use for classes. Uh, well, I will read it and return it to you. When you're finished. Maybe next well, oh. It's a quick while, but um, I'll try to read I'll read it as quickly as I can. If you look at the table of contents, you'll be able to see what I thought was interesting enough to, to try to give to the students to look at. Yeah, I you know, so I mark things, and uh, let me see, there's another page here. Yeah, I see various items. You don't have to look at those, but I just thought that those were some of the more interesting well, I like ones. to read, and well, my hearing is poor. Yeah. <laughs> I know how that is. Uh, I, you know, I'm getting to the point where, uh, you know, it's aging. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, yeah, that's right. And, uh, actually, you know, so many people my age have died. You know, all the people my, my age have died in my neighborhood. Yeah. But I'm still, you know, yeah. enjoying myself. Exactly. And, that's great. Um, I love being retired, actually, because yeah. I spent my life taking care of everyone. I know. You know? I know. Uh, there were 
not just my family, my mother, my husband, each of whom required five years of 24 oh, hours a year. And then, uh, you know, all the kids I took care of, I, I, the, the memory uh, in the commuter, I mean, you, you, I don't know how much memory you get, but we burned out the memory in our computer three times. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and I think, I mean, Brownsville wasn't that big, but I have in mind I might have hit 30,000 patients. That doesn't seem possible. Thank you a lot. It seems like that, but when you put it together, look back well, on it all. I was <laughs> obviously it was right See you, Doc. in the hospital. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. Uh, the one thing that's happened lately, I don't know if it's really going to happen, but uh, when I came here, and I had already practiced 10 years in Africa and mm -hmm. briefly in Germany and also in the U.S., but um, there were parterres. Oh, yeah. And right when I came no here, they medical were... experience. They had no sanitation. The the women that were pregnant had no prenatal care, oh, uh -huh. and they had nothing to resuscitate the baby. So what they would do, you know, the baby wouldn't breathe, and then they raced it to the emergency room. And I was practicing right next to the emergency room. <laughs> so you know. Oh, jeez. Uh, I remember that they used to tell women from Maramoros to look for the arco iris, the, the uh, uh, what do you call it? Oh, <laughs> sometimes I have trouble coming up with the words in yeah, English. Yeah, well, you see, I'm the same way. <laughs> Things that I, you know, uh, for instance, my, one of my big hobbies is horticulture, and I could remember the name of plants, you know, and now I can't remember their name. I know. <laughs> uh, you know, and oh, where did it go? The, uh, after the rain, you'd get the, what do you call it? The thing that shows up in the sky. Rainbow? The rainbow. Arco iris is the rainbow. They'd say, look for the arco iris, and what they were referring to was the McDonald's, and there was a parterra in the house right behind McDonald's. Oh, my head. <laughs> Well, thank you for the book. I really enjoyed it. I hope so. Well, yeah. and uh, I enjoy reading. Uh, well, it, since you enjoy reading, I'm glad I provided it for you. <laughs> oh, thank you. It's very, very kind of you. I knew vaguely. Well, I, I knew uh, a long time ago. First, uh, who she was married to your son, Peggy. Oh, yeah. And Peggy, there were a group of us that job three models every day. Oh, yeah. And she was one of them for a while. Uh, but she moved away. Whatever happened to her? She's in Arizona now. Uh, she had an old friend from Wyoming when she was young, a child. And they both live in uh, Phoenix. Phoenix now. So she's still managing to live with her disease? Uh, uh, yeah, but it's a struggle. Yeah, it yeah. is. It was yeah. even then. Yeah. Well, I've enjoyed the talks. Uh, my, unfortunately, Tuesday is my gardener's day, so... <laughs> <laughs>